Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining this session of the Open Source Summit Latin America um, conference. So today I'm going to talk about some tools and techniques to debug an embedded Linux system. Um, the idea here is really to, to show different ways and different techniques that we can apply when trying to identify and, and solve bugs in, in software uh, with that kind of uh, focus on embedded Linux, but most of the concepts here can also be applied on, on a, um, let's say, a desktop system. So yeah, a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Sergio Prado. I'm living in Sao Paulo, Brazil. I've been working uh, with uh, embedded systems for 25 plus years. For the last 10, uh, 12 actually uh, years, I've been working with my company, Embed Labworks, where I provide consulting and training services. Uh, I'm also an open source contributor, so I contribute to a few open source projects and uh, blogger on free time. So this is our agenda. I'm gonna quickly introduce some important concepts uh, related to debugging. And then we're gonna jump to real uh, situations where we need to, to uh, ana analyze bugs on an embedded Linux system. So I, I created here different kind of situations and uh, I'm gonna show lots of comments here and explain how they work and uh, what kind of techniques we can apply to, to try to find out uh, uh, the, the root of cause, right, when we are debugging problems on an embedded Linux. Uh, and I hope you enjoy. Um, so I'm going to start with a little bit of introduction on debugging. This is a kind of a joke, right? But I, I really like because usually when we write software, we think that our software doesn't have any bugs, but that's really not true, right? Oh, well. All software, I mean, have, I guess probably the only software that doesn't have bugs that the software that doesn't have one line. I don't know. <laughs> so software will always have bugs. Uh, it's a matter of finding those bugs. So usually, uh, I mean, this is again a joke when, and that's uh, kind of representing the six stages of the bugging. It starts from denial. You just said there is no bug there. I'm pretty sure I tested. And and then you start realizing that might be an issue, and then you just say like, doesn't happen on my machine, right? And until you ask yourself how how did that ever work, right? Um, the bug is kind of the process to removing bugs, right? And bug is that word that we have been using since the earlier times. Um, and by this term, we mean problems, right? A, a bug is a problem in a software, that an expected issue. And um, another phrase that I like a lot in the software development process, we spend 50 time percent debugging the software and the other 50 bugging. Um, if we think about kind of what would be the process to debug um, any software, we can kind of come up with five steps, right? At least I come up with five steps. And um, that would start with uh, understanding the problem that I guess it's one of the most important steps, right? Because if you don't understand the problem, how can you debug it, right? Um, the second step would be try to reproduce the problem. And that's also very important because if you, if you cannot reproduce it or if you cannot uh, reliably reproduce the problem, how can you be sure that you fix it, the problem when you apply some kind of fix, right? So the problem should be reproducible so you can make sure that in the end, you have fixed the problem. Third step would be identify the root cause. That's what 
usually takes some time depending on the issue but if you know the tools if you know the techniques and applying the right techniques depend on the type of problem you can be more assertive here and and find issues faster the first step would be fixing the problem and that's kind of uh, easy i would say because as soon as you identify the root cause fixing would mean changing the code compiling the code deploying and testing kind of easy right comparing to the other steps and if you fix it you just celebrate and go to another issue if not to get back to step one to see what is happening what went wrong thinking about the problems that we can have in software i come up with five kind of categories so just think about a problem i i could kind of uh, divide this problem in five different categories there is the, those kinds of crash issues right the software just crash for some reason like you can have in the kernel uh, kernel ops a kernel panic here in user space you can have segmentation foes so you have crash messages that you could investigate that is those kind of uh, lookup uh, issues where the software just hangs right and yeah usually i don't know some kind of uh, uh, error in the implementation i don't know some kind of issue in um in the synchronization of i don't know an application that is based on multiple threads the third kind of problem i'm calling here logic or implementation problem so the software just works but it doesn't do what it, what you do um, so you have an input you have some kind of processing and an output and the output is not the expected. It's a logic problem. Fourth type of problem, resource leakage. That's when you allocate resource, but after using this resource, you don't deallocate the resource. So the research just leaks. And uh, the last one, lack of performance. Everything works, but the performance is bad. Right? Usually an issue that is caused by a lack of performance. The user has some kind of uh, percep perception of bad quality, right? The usability is not good when you have this kind of uh, performance issues. And uh, for some reason, I could also come up with five different tools and techniques to debug those kinds of problems. I would say the first one, it's our brain because it probably the most important tool that we have right um our brain we need to think about sometimes think a lot about a problem think about different ways that the problem could happen um, and of course the technology is also important right to understand for example what is a segmentation for we need to understand why a segmentation flow happens because of the isolation of memory provided by the MMU and etc. Um, second uh, class of tools and techniques I'm calling post mortem analysis. That's where you just take some information and analyze that information, right? You don't do the debugging at runtime, you do it later. So collecting logs, analyzing the logs collecting dump memory dumps like a core dump analyzing those it's uh, what i'm calling post mortem analysis tracing that could relate to profiling um, this is a technique where you um, trace the code at runtime that's kind of one of the most used techniques i would say because everyone knows how to debug an application by putting prints in the code right so when you add prints to the code you are tracing the application um, but it's important to know here that sometimes you don't need to put prints in the code sometimes there are uh, a complete kind of infrastructure to trace the application. For example, the kernel has ftrace, complete infrastructure to trace kernel function calls and 
profile functions. I mean, you can do lots of different things with F-Trace. Uh, in user space, you also have a few nice tools like S-Trace, L-Trace, Perf, that you can use to, to trace user space applications. Another technique to debug applications is uh, interactive debugging, GDB. So you can just run your application step by step, interact with the application, um, inspect the memory, right? That's another way to debug an application. Last one I would call, I'm calling here debugging frameworks. That's where you use um, some kind of tools that were made to debug on a specific kind of problem. The kernel has a few debugging frameworks. I'm going to mention it here later. And a very known uh, debugging framework is called Valgrind. It's kind of framework to develop uh, memory related tools. So Valgrind, for example, is a tool used to try to find uh, memory leaks and other kind of uh, memory related problems in applications. So yeah, so uh, so far we talked a little bit about a different kind of problems that we can have and different kind of tools that can help us to debug those problems. Now we're gonna uh, go over each one of these main uh, types of problems, see some real cases on an embedded Linux device, and 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 talk about how can we debug those kind of issues. So let's start with post-mortem analysis. Post-mortem analysis, as I mentioned, is a kind of technique where you extract information from a system, in our case, an embedded Linux device, and then you analyze that information. Could be logs from the device, could be some kind of memory dump, right? Like an application core dump. And then you take this to your device and analyze it. Let's see a little bit of how that is done. So here I have a kernel ops message. The kernel shows this message when something very bad happened at kernel space. And um, it's kind of scary for those who don't know what is happening, but there are a lot of useful information here, right? So for example, the first nine, we can see the reason why the kernel crashed, a no pointer the reference inside the kernel. We have information about where was the program counter at the moment the issue happened. With this information, we can find out the line of code in the Linux kernel that caused this crash. And in the end, we have a backtrace of the problem. A backtrace is a kind of um, uh, stack of functions that were called until the problem happened. Here, because of the the size of the slide, we, I cannot put the the complete backtrace, right? But here we have all of the functions that were called until the next one. It's a backtrace, so from the last one to the first one, this is the last one, the function that crashed, and that function was called by, by this one and so on. How can we analyze this kind of uh, message, right? We can use several tools here. Uh, for example, ADDR, ADDR to line or, or even GDB. Uh, what do we need to debug this kind of problems? We need the kernel source code because the idea here is to take that address and uh, resolve to a symbol, right? We have an address here. We can take this address or we can take uh, this um, function plus index of the function that causes the problem. That's basically the same thing. Storage probe plus 60 and this uh, address. That's basically the same thing. We can take this and try to convert to a line of code. For that, we we need the kernel source code. We need the Linux image in the ELF format. That's the VM Linux. When you build Linux, you have this file, the VM Linux file. You need this one uh, with the bugging symbols. That's important. 
we can see here that this this L file has the bug info. So you have to compile the Linux kernel with the bug info. There is an option there in the kernel hacking menu. So you just recompile the kernel with the bugging symbols. You're gonna have this VM Linux file with the bugging symbols and the kernel source code with that. You can run, for example, ADGR2 line from your tool chain. In my case here, I'm, I'm running uh, the kernel on an ARM device. So my, I'm using my cross compiler tool chain. And then <clears throat> with ADDR2 line, I can just take that address, the program counter address, uh, give the to the L file with the bugging symbols, and it will show me the function, the source code, and the line that caused that crash. I can also do the same with uh, GDB from my cross compiler tool chain. I just have to pass the VM Linux file, the kernel image uh, in the L format with the bugging symbols, and then I can just run this command list uh, asking the kernel to convert this to uh, the address. And then I can have here uh, the address, the source code, the line, that's the same result, right? And I can see that in this case, this was the offending line, the line that caused the crash. That doesn't mean that we should remove this line to solve the bug, right? But that does mean that we should analyze. We know now where to start. We know now that if we look at this code, you can see that we are the referencing point here. So this one, no. And we need to find out why this pointer is no. What about a crash in user space? Um, let's say we were on a program and it's like false. When that happens, it means the application tries to access a, a, a memory address that is not allowed. Um, to do uh, this kind of uh, post-mortem analysis in user space, we need to generate a core dump file. By default, the kernel doesn't generate core dump files for user space applications. We have to enable it. And there is this small tool, view limit, that you can use for that. This tool is able to configure process limits. One of the limits is the size of the core file. So with this command here, we can set an unlimited size for the core file. And then after running this command and running the program again, the core will be dumped. And then in, in my specific case here, where I don't have anything special configured, the core file is generated in the same directory that I run the application. This is a kind of uh, snapshot of the memory. So I can take this snapshot and open in GDB to analyze the problem. So I can see here the file. Um, what, I, what do I need to analyze core dump? I need the source code of the application and I need the application with the bugging symbols. That's also important. So having those, I can take this core file to my machine and then open it with GDB. So here I'm using GDB with the application, the binary with the bugging symbols and the core file. And as soon as I open this application, the kernel will just um, because, the, sorry, not the kernel, the tool, GDB. Uh, so as soon as I, know, I, know, I'm, I open the core dump and with GDB, GDB will, will say that um, the application crashed with a segmentation fault. And it will also tell me the line of code that caused the crash. I can see here the line of code. And um, what is nice is that it's a kind of, a, again, a snapshot of the memory. So I can inspect the memory. I can even like go up and down in the stack if I want. So here I'm listing the source code and I can see the line that caused the crash, right? And I can just ask you what happened here? Why this crash? It could be the options uh, pointer, could be, could be the RQV pro pointer. And then I can just inspect memory. I can print options. I can see that options is, is a, it seems like to be a pointer, but when I try to print the RGV pointer, I can see that is no. Then I can 
like C. That, that's why it's crashed, the RGV point there is no. And then, I mean, I can't keep the investigation inside the B. I can go up in the stack to try to identify why RGV is no and, and so on. Oh, so that is very useful, right? To, especially when you don't have fixed physical access to the device. Um, because if you have physical access, maybe doing an interactive debug is better because then you can run the code step by step to try to, to identify the issue. But if you don't have physical access, you can just tell someone, please send me the core file and then I, I can analyze you, something like this. Another technique to debug is tracing. And as I mentioned, trace is very popular, right? You add prints in the code, you are tracing the application. When you add prints in the code, you are basically uh, adding trace points to the application that we usually call static trace points. Because you are adding the trace points at build time. That it, there are also tools and frameworks that are able to add the trace points at runtime, and that's very nice also. Um, there are tracing uh, tools that you can use in carry space and also in user space. And tracing is very useful to identify specific kind of issues. For example, to measure time, tracing is very useful to do measurements and find out performance issues, why that function is taking a lot of time, things like this. Um, sometimes tracing is very useful to find out lockup issues when an application just lock up, you can trace and try to identify where it is stopping the execution. Here I have a few use cases. So um, first, uh, a lockup issue in kernel space. So here I kind of added a bug in the kernel where when you run, actually this is not a lockup. It, the, it's a kind of a issue where it takes a lot of time to run. So I, I put it a bug, I could, um, added a bug in the kernel to um, when you do something very simple like this, um, setting the brightness of a LED, I mean, um, turning on an LED, uh, it takes four seconds. So tracing could be a good option here to debug this problem, right? And for that, trace the kernel, the best option that we have is F-Trace. It's a very nice framework to, to uh, trace the Linux kernel. And uh, if you go to the kernel menu configuration, you're gonna see there the kernel hacking menu. Inside the kernel hacking menu, you're gonna see F-Trace or kernel tracing. I don't remember exactly. And then there are a lot of options there that you can enable. And that's basically what you, what you need. Then when you enable F-Trace, you're gonna have a trace file system, TraceFS. If you mount, you can mount anywhere, but usually we mount on sys kernel tracing. You're gonna have several files there to um, configure the tracing. You can do that by hand. I mean, write on those files to do the tracing. But, our, but that is a nice tool called the Trace CMD. That is a kind of front end for F-Trace and the Trace file system. And here I'm using this tool. So Trace CMD, I want to record and do a function graph tracing of this command. So, so this tool will configure F-Trace to trace the functions executed in kernel space for this specific application. And then it will save this in a, a trace.dat file that I can open with trace cmd report to see. And that's what I'm doing here. Um, and then we can see all of the kernel functions that were called during uh, the execution of that application and then looking at the functions i can see why that take i can see this mslip function that took 40 uh, four seconds to run there is another nice tool call it kernel shark that is basically a tool to parse 
it's a graphical tool to parse that that file and show you what happened during that trace um, and it's graphical you can you have better visualization here and you can see also the issue looking here the end slip function that causes the uh, the delay in the execution of that process another now in user space another nice tool to trace a linux system is s trace so let's say you run a command and it just fails and you don't know why just run s trace just run that command with S trace. S trace is a tool to trace the system calls. So it will show you all of the system calls executed by the application. And sometimes that's very useful. So for example, here I'm running this tool, uh, Netcat, and it's failing with this error, could not set up a listening socket. If I run the same command with S trace, I can see all of the system calls and I can say, why is failing right this is the failure right this is the right the message the failure message and two system calls above we have the error the bind call it passed here a new argument and should not be new it failed and then it have this message so just running as trace you don't hit, need anything there just as trace and and I mean, you just run applications with S trace, you can inspect what's happening and try to identify what's going on. Very useful. Um, let's say you want to, uh, S trace is a kind of limited in terms of it only traces system calls, right? There is another nice tool that is called L trace that also traces library calls and could also trace system calls. So. Um, but let's say you want to trace your own applica application. You want to trace the functions of your application. So for that, there is a framework in the kernel called uProbe that you could use. It's kind of hard to use the uProbe framework by hand, but you could use perf um, for that. So here I have another problem. I run eth2 and it just freezes hangs and i have uprobe enabled in the kernel and i have perf installed in the system so what i need to do this uh, tracing i need application with debugging symbols because perf will uh, collect the symbols from the application and add dynamic trace points to those symbols i can do that with this command here so here i'm running perf probe in this binary so it will collect all of the symbols find out the, the the addresses of those symbols and add dynamic trace point points to those symbols using the uprobe framework from the kernel i can list after running this command i can list all of the probes that perf added and then i can just run the application uh, and record the result it will generate a perf.data file that I could open with perf script. And I can see all of the functions called in the application until the one that frees it. And then I can open the source code and try to find out why this application is freezing. You could see here that I didn't like open the source code and added printers to it because there are tools that do that for me, kind of, right? So I don't need that. Uh, another technique to debug a Linux system is interactive debugging. And um, it's a kind of very uh, useful technique when you want to understand what any kind of piece of software is doing, right? You connect to the software, you run the software step by step, you inspect variables. I mean, you can do everything with the with the software at the execution time. The main tool for that is GDB. And uh, you can really do interactive debugging in both kernel space, user space, very effectively uh, on a embedded Linux device. The only issue here is that it's a remote 
debugging architecture because you have the binary that you want to debug on the device you have the source code and the tools on the host device so the host have all of the source code has all of the source code and the tools and the target uh, has the binary that you want to debug and then you have you need some kind of connection between those could be a serial port usually is an ethernet port and then uh, you can start a remote debugging session and that is a protocol defined by the gdb community so uh, there is a GDB server, a GDB client, and then you can start the server on the target device and run a client on the host machine that will connect to the server and send commands that will be executed by the server. That's kind of the main idea and the architecture on doing this kind of remote debugging. So, and you can do this with user space or kernel space. Here I'm doing a uh, kernel space debugging uh, remote debugging session so i run running this command and it is not working I, ju I just want to understand why when i set a heartbeat of the led it doesn't work what i need to do this kind of uh, interactive debugging in the linux kernel i need kgdb enabled kgdb it's kernel gdb it's basically a gdb server implementation in the linux kernel it's uh, the gdb protocol implemented in the linux kernel so i need to enable it and also the serial driver so uh, currently the kernel only supports a serial connection and then i will need a serial connection with the kernel to do this kind of remote debugging and then after that, I have to put the kernel in um, debug mode. That can be done at boot time if I pass a specific argument to Linux kernel, or that can be done at runtime. Here I'm doing at runtime. So I'm configuring what is the serial part that, that I will use for remote debugging. And after that, I am uh, starting or change, moving the kernel to debug mode. When I uh, write G to the Caesar RQ trigger, I'm um, putting the kernel in the buggy mode. And then the kernel will just freeze. We do nothing. We stop waiting for a connection to start the bugging. Then I go to the host while to do the bugging. In the host, what I need, of course, the kernel source code. I need the uh, kernel image with the bugging symbols the VM Linux file with the bugging symbols. And of course, GDB from my toolchain. So I will open the kernel image with the bugging symbols in the L file with GDB. After that, I'm gonna connect to the target device. And then I'm done. After that, I'm connected to the kernel and I can just debug the kernel. I can run continuity and then the kernel will run. I can put breakpoints. I can run step by step the code. And here I'm doing as I'm, I'm putting a breakpoint in a function called leg trigger write. After that, I can continue the execution and then the kernel will stop the execution on that function. And then I can go um, run the code step by step, line by line, to see what's happening with that specific function in the LEDs framework. In user space, it's simpler to do it. You just need on the device GDB server. So let's say you run an application and it hangs. That's the, the case here. I'm running this application and it is hanging. So what I have to do is run this application with GDB server. And uh, here I'm using a network connection, so it will open a local port, one, two, three, four, to wait for a connection to run this, to debug this application. In the host, what I need to debug, the search code of the application, the application with debugging symbols, and GDB. Then I run the application, with GDB, actually I'm run GDB, passing the application, and I like to start GDB in TUI mode. Then I connect to the device, 
Again, here I'm using a network connection, so the IP of the device and the port that I started listening in the in the target. And then after that, it will be connected. Then I can just continue the execution because it is kind of hanged or freezed. If I run the application and then stop it with Control C, I can I can basically see where it is freezed, right? Because it, if it is freezed in a specific line of code, I can see that just like here. Uh, there are also several debugging frameworks that can help debugging in kernel space or in user space. By debugging frameworks, I mean, they are tools that were built to solve specific debugging issues. For example, you want to identify um, locks in kernel space, locks, uh, locking problems, right, in kernel space. That is a framework, the debugging framework for that. You want to identify memory leaks in kernel space. That is a debugging framework for that. Usually debugging frameworks, they add some overhead in the system, so you should not enable by default only when you want to debug the application. A very classic example of debugging framework is Valgrind. It's a kind of framework created to debug memory issues. Um, very popular, for example, to debug memory leaks in applications. Again, I have here a few use cases using those kind of debugging framework tools. Um, first, a problem in kernel space. I try to, I'm trying here to, to see slash uh, proc slash uptime and it just hangs. Um, then I go to the kernel, I enable the, the lookup detectors from the kernel. It's a kind of a debugging framework from the kernel to identify lookups in kernel space when uh, an application just locks, hangs in kernel space. Then I run the application and wait until I get a kernel whoops. Then the kernel will say like that the uh, CPU got stuck for X seconds. I can see where it got stuck. So the function, the index, I can see the address also and I have a backtrace. Here, I can do the same kind of post-mortem analysis, right? I can take this information, for example, the program counter, and then use ADDR to line or GDB to find out the line of code that is causing this lockup. For that, I need the kernel source code. I need the kernel with the bugging symbols. And I can use again ADDR to line, giving the address, and I can get the source code that is uh, hanging in the kernel. Which DB is easier because it shows me the source code. So I can just run the list command and it will say like it's line 37, this one that is hanging. Very nice. Um, another situation, a memory leak in user space. So I'm running this CPU load tool and memory leaks when I run this tool. How can I identify where the memory is leaking in the source code? I can use Valgrind for that. So I need Valgrind installed. I need also, if I want to solve symbols, when I you could like, I want to write to, to tell me where in the source code of that application, memory is leaking. For that, I need to install the application with the bugging symbols in the device. Then I just run Valgrind. For Valgrind, I want a complete check of a memory leaks, and this is the application. And then Valgrind will run. Valgrind is a kind of uh, emulator because it will um, run the application in a kind of a virtual CPU 
or um, so it will run structure by so the application will run very slowly and the, the timings of the application will be impacted that's important to know um, that's how it is done that's how it is able to monitor the memory and see what's going on um, but it works very well and uh, you have to let the application run and then stop it at some time and then as soon as we stop the application it will show a report of what's happening and then you can see like total heap usage right the amount of allocations and the allocations in the memory um, this field is very important definitely lost that this field means um, lots of memory will uh, leaked during execution and uh, and here we have a kind of backtrace of the leaks and here we can see that uh, something probably uh, pro not probably uh, some symbol in the libc called this function do is that that call it this one that call it this one so this malloc leaked that was called by this function print cpu load that is in cpu load.c line 79 so with this information we know we can open the source code to try to find out find out why this malloc called inside this function in this line is leaking memory why it is not freeing that memory so very easily we could find out the malloc call that was causing the leak just using just running the application with foreground so my point here um, is that usually we do a lot of debugging adding prints to the code right and sometimes that's useful but i would say that most of the times there are better tools and techniques for debugging so adding prints in the code might help in a specific situation but most of the time you might want to apply other techniques for debugging and what we have seen here um, several different techniques to debug right uh, post marketing uh, tracing interactive debugging using debugging frameworks and those kind of different techniques can be applied to different problems for example you will not want to use gdb to do performance analysis uh, because it will impact the performance of the system it's better not using gdb for that um, gdb is a kind of for example a perfect tool for a logic problem right the application not doing what's supposed to do you run it with gdb step by step to try to identify what is doing wrong uh, but not for performance analysis now for example tracing is a very nice tool for performance analysis because you can trace the code you can find out um, timings measure things so it might be very useful for performance analysis and that's all my point here uh, i added kind of uh, a green yellow and, and red uh, faces here to and i mean this is really my opinion you could have other opinions on what kind of tools would be better for, for what kind of problems but in the end the point here is that uh, we should know all of these tools we should know all of these techniques to be more productive on trying to debug an embedded linux system and uh, sometimes we have to get out of our inertia right because we think that oh it's going to take a lot of time for me to, to understand and and learn gdb so i'm going to add print to the code right now we should try to get out of this kind of state of mind and really like think about learning new stuff um so learning ftrace learning perf learn gdb learn all of those tools because one day 
you're gonna need it and uh, you're gonna be very productive much more productive using those tools uh, to debug problems in a Linux system so I hope you enjoy this talk um, those are my contacts feel free to reach me you can send me an email you can reach me on LinkedIn or Twitter I hope again you enjoy this talk and uh, yeah until next time bye bye